So I'm going to officially start this Google Hangout uh, for our Visti Live webinar series, and it is sort of odd to wonder if there's anyone out there listening to us. <laughs> but uh, welcome, everyone. And this is Karen Richardson. I'm the executive director of the Virginia Society for Technology and Education, and I am pleased to welcome you to this evening's um, talk about University of Mary Washington's interesting program, A Domain of One's Own, um, in an effort to help students claim their digital identities and figure out what that means. Uh, Mary Washington has put this program in place and Tim Owens and Tim, I'm sorry, in the midst of figuring out all the Google Hangout stuff, I forgot to look up your title. Somewhere your somewhere your instructional technology superhero, I think. Yeah. Is that your <laughs> Gmail or your Google that, tagline? Instructional technology specialist. Yeah, right. So any, oh perfect. Okay, at Mary Washington, we are thrilled to have Tim here. He is also a board member of the Visti Board of Directors. Um, we also have with us in the room Tim Stommer. Tim is the co-chair or just chair of the Hacker Space. Too many Tims, exactly, of the hacker space that we will be having at this year's conference. And so I think he's here to talk a little bit about that as well. I will send out reminders to anyone who's out there listening that our big event is coming up in just about three months. Is that how many months it could be that soon? Um, we'll be having uh, the conference at the months. Hotel Roanoke. Oh, don't say that. December 8th, 9th, and 10th at the Hotel Roanoke and Conference Center, and you can head to visticonference.org for more information. Um, and finally, if you want to uh, have other fun events like this show up in your email, um, you can join visti.org. It is a free membership, and this year we are going to be experimenting with different ways of delivering webinars. So this is our first shot at Google Hangouts and YouTube. I am going to go ahead and drop out of the Google Hangout and go to the YouTube, and I'm going to turn it over to the Tims. <laughs> the Tims. Um, the Tims. Yeah, and, you know, I'll reiterate what we've said earlier before about this. This is sort of an experiment for us, which I think is, is fun and cool to really just decide to turn everything on its head. We've done webinars at Visti for a while now. We've used Adobe Connect, which is, you know, perfectly fine. Uh, a lot of people are using Google Plus uh, and using the Google Hangout, so we really wanted to give it a shot. So and it offers a lot of interesting tools. Um, Tim, so in, in terms of like the format and stuff, I've, I've got a couple slides that I think sort of talk about sort of the history of our project, Domain of One's Own, at UMW, and sort of how that got started, what Domain of One's Own is, and sort of where we see things going. And then I definitely want to start a conversation with you about sort of more of the why, why you do this, why is it important, and that kind of thing. And then sure. we can kind of get into the hacker space at Visti. Does that work? Sure. All right, cool. Um, so uh, one last little note here is if you're watching on YouTube, there's a Q&A section. You can actually ask questions in there, and I know Karen's going to be monitoring them. I think they'll be in here as well for me, but I am going to do a little screen sharing so that you can see some slides. Uh, so feel free to ask questions in there as they come up, uh, and we'll catch them near towards the end and sort of address them during the conversation part of it. I am going to switch over screen sharing here uh, to these slides. So you should see this here. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the project that we're doing at the University of Mary Washington. It's called A Domain of One's Own, which is the uh, title of the event tonight and everything. Um, so, you know, a little bit of background and history. Um, about six years ago or so, 2007, 2006, somewhere around there, I want to say, uh, my department, I work in the Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies, uh, they started what they called the Bluehost experiment, and the uh, the director at the time gave everybody in my department a Bluehost account. I wasn't there for this, but he gave everybody at the time a Bluehost account and said, I want you to really start experimenting with having your own uh, server space, your own web host, your ability to install these applications, and really see what you could do with that. And so they really just started playing around with this idea of having a space of your own to really host and do some interesting projects and things. Um, that led to some really interesting projects. One of them by uh, my now my boss, uh, Jim Groom, was that he worked with the English and uh, foreign language department to set up a WordPress multi-site called ELS Blogs. And ELS Blogs was a very early uh, WordPress multi-site install that allowed uh, any student and any faculty in that department to get their own uh, 
own little blog as a part of this larger WordPress install. For them, it was a pretty radical idea to really start pushing the idea of blogging in the classroom. Uh, and, you know, that's something that we've done at Mary Washington time and again in different classes, is sort of tried to push for this idea of doing your courses, doing your course work as a student out in the open. It led to uh, some really interesting courses, one of them being DS-106, which is a digital storytelling course that's taught at the University of Mary Washington. Uh, and, you know, it's this idea of experimentation that's continued to drive my department and what they do. So this digital storytelling course, uh, Jim Groom had taught it for several years, and then in, uh, in spring of 2011, he decided, you know what, maybe I'll just open it up for anybody to take. Why not? I, he was already doing some interesting stuff with students. He was already publishing that stuff in a WordPress site. And he was also having his students get their own spaces. Part of this class was that his students would have to actually sign up for a hosting account and create their blog out there, experiment with the themes and the plugins, and really get into the nitty gritty of owning and controlling your own space. He opened it up for anybody to take, and a lot of people uh, joined in on that, and it's something that sort of continues and has sort of its own community as a part of that. One th other thing that came out of ELS Blogs was a site called UMW Blogs. It was the ability to open up this WordPress multi-site install past just a department and say, what if we as a community were able to let anybody get their own publishing platform using WordPress. So this was a WordPress multi-site install that's continued to grow year after year. Uh, usually we have somewhere in the order of 20 to 30 courses using it uh, and, you know, hundreds of students. At this point, there's over uh, 7,800 websites on UMW blogs and I believe about 10,000 users. So sometimes it's a whole course sharing one blog, sometimes it's every student having its own blog. Uh, but this started getting at the idea of an open publishing platform for Mary Washington. Um, everything being driven by that Bluehost experiment, by this idea that you could have a space of your own to really experiment on the web and getting at this idea of a domain of one's own. So uh, let me talk a little bit about what the domain of one's own actually is. Um, this is a project that we uh, were able to come up with what was it, uh, last spring, uh, we had been talking about this for many years and we had finally figured out a way where we could offer web hosting to students so that they wouldn't be limited by UMW blogs to only be able to use WordPress. We wanted them to actually have their own server space to install whatever they wanted to and to have it be tied back to a domain that they got to own and control. You know, not that it was a URL that was like, you know, mywebsite.umwblogs.org, but that it could be something like timowens.com, um, you know, or something like that. So Domain of One's Own offers this slice of a server along with the web hosting uh, for the students. And this is sort of the idea. Up top, you can see students get to choose their own domain name. That's a really important piece of this. The domain name is the address, the URL that they choose that's really a part of their identity. A lot of our students choose some variation of their name, you know, because we talk to them about uh, this being a professional presence for them, something that they want uh, to be, you know, tied back to them for years to come. In some cases, if they have a really common name, for example, they might not be able to get it, so they have to get a little bit more creative, and some just choose to, and so you, you get some like hockeyandheels.com, which is kind of awesome, too. Uh, that domain name is tied back to a piece of server space on there where they can install any piece of open source software. A lot of them choose to do WordPress, but they can do a lot of other things on there. And so as a part of that domain, then you uh, down there you can see uh, they are creating their online presence through blogs, through professional websites, whatever the uh, case may be. They can install a variety of different software. I mentioned WordPress. They can do MediaWiki, which is the wiki software that runs uh, Wikipedia. They can do Drupal. They can do OwnCloud. If you haven't heard of OwnCloud, it's an open source sort of Dropbox alternative. So they can actually install OwnCloud on there, and there's apps for the desktop, for iPhone, that allow them to actually upload their files to that space as opposed to a corporate space that's always trying to sell you on the next big thing. Uh, Zen Photo down there in the bottom right is actually a um, open source photo gallery software, so it's a little bit like running your own Flickr. Um, so, and not that these spaces actually replace, you know, 
Flickr or, you know, Facebook or Dropbox or anything like that, but that they could supplement it and that they would give the experience to the student to start experimenting on the web in their own space and experimenting with these tools. We've made it really simple in our space by having sort of this one-click installer. So when they log into their control panel, it's really just one click. They hit install something, they choose your username and password for their various installs, and they can go, and they can really start to play with that stuff. Um, I want to get a little bit at why this is important um, and then open this up a little bit more for discussion. And I sort of breezed through all that, so we're going to have a lot more time for discussion, but that's perfectly fine. Uh, you know, just as started off with, you know, I mentioned that we've done this for several years, and we do have a few examples of students who are doing some really interesting stuff. This is one that graduated uh, two years ago, even before Domain of One's Own. He was using UMW Blogs as this idea of having your personal space online. And so uh, this is Hassan Halim. Uh, this is a, a guy who was in the SGA and doing a lot of interesting stuff. He was an editor for the student newspaper here. And so he actually bought his domain while he was a student there and mapped it onto UMW Blogs. He bought HireHassan.com. Uh, you know, and so his tagline on his website was Hire Hassan, two words, one choice. And so he was actually using his as a space that was very clearly to sell himself. To, to be some professional presence that he could hand off to employers. And you can see from his website here that he made sort of an all-in-one page that would describe all the various things that he had done as a part of his time at Mary Washington, which I think is really powerful for students. How often do you have students doing a lot of really incredible work in your class? Uh, but, you know, three, four years from now, if they have to be able to show that to an employer, what are they going to bring to that interview? What are they going to hand them? Are they going to come in with a bin full of papers and say, here's, you know, what I wrote, here's, you know, the, the science project that I did? No. I mean, we live and breathe on the web now. And so the ability to hand someone a URL, or even better for them to Google your name and find out information about you in this way, I think is really powerful uh, for students. This is another example, Caitlin Murphy. Uh, she actually designed her own minor. So she was a history major, and she wrote a digital studies minor. That's something you can do at uh, Mary Washington, is you can put together a set of courses and make the argument to be a uh, minor. Or Sorry, she is a double major, actually. It says right there. Um, and she was doing a lot with photography, a lot with video, and a lot of really interesting work. And so she put together this really impressive portfolio of her work. Uh, she just recently got a job at PBS, and they credit her uh, website with one of the reasons that they went with her, because it was just so professionally put together. And this was something that she was able to show uh, as an archive of the work that she had done right out there in the open on the web. So think about, you know, have you ever Googled your name? You know, and I wonder if you would even ask your students, if they were to Google their name, what would they find out, depending on their age? they may not have much of an identity on the web. When I talk to college students, they have some sort of identity, but they may not be really happy with the kind of stuff that they see. This is an, a chance for them to take control of that presence, to really become the authoritative person about who you are, uh, which I think is really powerful. We also did an initiative at Mary Washington with the faculty, where we had 30 faculty join us and actually get their own domains and actually go through the entire process that these students were doing last spring. Uh, they blogged out in the open. They were talking about the stuff. They were learning all about this. And I think that was really powerful, too, uh, to allow them the opportunity to really understand what this was about. I'm going to switch back here for a minute. Um, so, you know, I mean, let's open this up sort of as a conversation. I'm interested in your thoughts, Tim, because I know you all are running a hacker space, and one of the things that comes up often that when we've talked with other people about web hosting and the whole idea of, you know, managing your own server space, the, it, it comes up, you know, this idea of students needing to know things like the ability to code or, or how useful that can be, the ability to understand the nuts and bolts of how things work. And, I, and in my eyes, this project gets a little bit at that because it sort of helps them understand how the web works, you know, as opposed to just being a regular consumer of the web, you know, and just sort of, I go to Facebook, but I don't really know how, you know, Facebook is able to show me that stuff or how all that works. Uh, by managing your own space, maybe they understand a little bit more. I don't know 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's uh, that's something I've been a big advocate for is that I think everybody, every adult should certainly have their own space on the web. You see a lot of, you know, billions of people lining up for for Facebook and everything, and basically you're giving them content that they're turning around and selling. Now, maybe your content's only valuable to you and a couple of other people, but it's still valuable in some way or another. And so what you're doing here is is you're really helping them, like you say, understand the web, understand why it's important for uh, them to have their own uh, space on the web and to, to use it responsibly. And this is this is the kind of thing that I'd like to see pushed down into high school. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's too soon to, to talk to a, a freshman about you know, because they're already on the web, they're already, you know, uh, using Facebook, they're already using Twitter, or whatever else is out there, Pinterest. Um, so why not talk to them about how, how do you set up your own uh, space on the web and why is it important that you have control over your own, uh, your own thoughts, your own material, your own work, instead of putting it up for somebody else to, to uh, sell ads off of. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting, you know. I we we do get I've gotten the chance to talk. So we rolled out Domain of One Zone. We did a pilot last year with 400 students, and then this year we rolled it out to all freshmen and said this is something that's available for you to sign up. The the university will cover the entire charge, and you can sign up. You can choose your own domain and get started. I got to talk with some of those students that that were going to be incoming freshmen uh, or who were going through the admissions process and. Uh, every so often, I'd actually have a parent say, "Will you allow them to bring their domain with them?" You know, which is kind of interesting too. That there was the occasional student who already had a space, maybe because their parents set it up for them, or they might have done it as a part of a class. I've I've talked to some people in um, K twelve who are using this, um, the ideas of this, uh, you know, as part of their course now. Um, through another project I'm doing Reclaim Hosting, which was sort of the idea of Domain of One's Own pushed out to anybody who wanted to do that. So, um, But I totally agree with you. By the time they get to college, it's not that it's too late, but this stuff is so much more valuable if it's embedded in the curriculum, even at the high school level. So, so by the time they're coming into college, they already have an idea of the way they want to frame their work, as opposed to you know when they come in here as freshmen, as sophomores, and get their space, they're still trying to figure out how they're going to organize it, what they can use, and that kind of thing. Well, and Josh uh, says he's interested in high school student portfolios. That's what I think a portfolio is these days. It's it's a, it's a blog. It's it's your own site, uh, kind of a stream of consciousness sort of deal where um, you're, you're putting up whatever you think of that day or whatever you created that day and it doesn't necessarily have to be part of a formal project. Maybe a student went out and did uh, some kind of uh, oh, community service sort of project or something on their own. They went out and, and uh, worked with some sort of community service deal. That becomes part of their uh, their portfolio because that's part of them and that's what uh, that's what I think the whole thing is is that you're creating a space that represents you and that's that's pretty powerful stuff yeah and I think we have a tendency to think that this stuff is really so hard that it's beyond our students and you know I I don't um, for a second buy into this idea that oh our students are there's two sides of the spectrum. It's either our students are digital natives and they can just do everything and we don't have to actually teach them at all because they already know everything and you know we just give ourselves a free pass with that. Uh, the other side of the spectrum is that's way too hard for them. They would never understand it. They couldn't get it. So let, why even bother? And ironically, both of those end up just being excuses for why to even, you know, <laughs> as an educator, why should why should we even try? You know, it's it's not we know best for our students. They're not going to get this, and it's not that big a deal. What we found is that you know the, the the sophistication of the tools these days is to the point where you know it is easy for students to pick some of this stuff up. It's challenging. Uh, it it actually absolutely is a learning process for them. Um, but it does work. It um, and you know 
it's, you know, we were able to do some really interesting experimentation type stuff where we had that one-click installer. So installing WordPress no longer is download the files, upload them to the server, set up a database, create a database user, assign it to the database, and then hopefully do a couple installation steps, run a SQL script, and then you're up and running. And you know, <laughs> That's valuable at some well, point you know, for the right type of student, but, you know, you there is yeah. You mentioned MediaWiki earlier, though. That's not something I'd wish on anybody that's a beginner. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge MediaWiki fan, and I would love for someone to come along and do a really nice open-source wiki software that was also intuitive and had a UI that made right. sense. Right. It would be nice, yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, but I, I'm, a big, I'm a big WordPress advocate because uh, I've, I've put up WordPress sites for other people and I make them sit down and watch how I do it. And it, it, it you know, they have their famous five-minute install and thing. And it's really not that hard to do. I mean, especially with the tools that most of the uh, the web hosting services give you. You know, so I mean, it, and uh, most of them, like you say, have the one-click install now. So I mean, it's just a matter of you know, I yes, I want one. Here's what I'm going to call it. Punch the button, and there you go. Karen, you want to say something? Uh, so he. I do. So, can you tell? So, here's my question: um, If you don't, is there an alternative if you don't have access to a server or a multi-user WordPress? And like Josh, so I I just got started on this project in my town, and on every other day or so I'm going to help the kids and we're going to play with Scratch and maybe do some digital video and they're kids who don't have access to computers and so this will be their chance but yeah I want them to set up their space first so that they can have a place to put their video and that kind of thing so like can I do multi-user WordPress on Bluehost do they let you do that or is that something hippie hosting allows um, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, with shared hosting, you can definitely do, you know, a multi-user install like that, a multi-site right. install of WordPress. It, at some point, scale becomes a problem. UMW Blog started out as on a $7.99 a month Bluehost account. Wow. It was only after it started growing to hundreds of users where it was like, okay, we need to, you know, get its own server and do its own thing. But right. It's, yeah, most, most, of the, uh, most of the services I've looked at, claim they'll do unlimited uh, bandwidth, unlimited storage, but they do have limits in there. And they're, if you read the terms of service real closely, if you start getting up to some real heavy-duty traffic, they're going to try and push you off on a more expensive, uh, you know. But even, even more expensive is not that big a deal. I mean, uh, there's a couple, I've looked at a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, services you know, with a, with a uh, dedicated server, and you're not talking more than twenty to thirty dollars a month. I mean, and that's and for an, a small organization with some income or something like that, that would be more than enough for several hundred people in a multi-user site. So, is there a free version or an alternative for a little organization that you know didn't want to start with paying money or Bluehost or I mean, gonna, would you have you a recommendation, or? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I, there's, well, here's, so what, I think some of it depends on what your needs are and what you want to do, because, you know, if you're trying right. to do coding, maybe what you want is for all of them to have FTP accounts, and so you could tag that on to your existing hosting that you already have for XYZ. Right. It'll yep. usually let you have unlimited FTP accounts. You set up a user ID and password for each of your students, and that's usually okay, and within the bounds of most terms of service, you can double check on that, and you set up accounts for them. Now, that doesn't give them access to the control panel and to install software, but that does give them file access if you're teaching them. Well, these are software. middle schoolers, yeah, so yeah. these are well, seventh graders. I'll, I'll give you an example. But, yeah, so I guess, I guess and, and then I'll be quiet, but I guess they, I mean, I guess the point here is we're trying to make them not just responsible, but also understand how it works, that there's things besides Google Sites and even though yeah. we're making good use of Google this evening. But, do, right, we, we really want them to see that you can not only control your digital identity, but you can control your digital destiny. You don't have sure. to always be watching commercials and that sort of well, thing. Well, and, uh, you know, the other, the other op uh, option for this kind of thing is to create 
a community, one site that has everybody in it as, you know, with their own accounts and they create a community. One of the things that um, one of our trainers did for his elementary school is he created a, an online newspaper for them. And so all of the teachers and all the students have accounts in there. Now the students have accounts that require that their, their posts be moderated. Um, Contributor, I guess, is what uh, WordPress calls it. Um, so that when the student writes something or posts something up there, it sits there until so, uh, until uh, one of the teachers, who's an author or uh, administrator, approves it. So you know it's moderated. So we're not ta talking about free and open access to it. But the students then uh, understand a little bit about how the back end works because they have to understand how to how to write in that little word processing sort of thing and they have to understand what it means to to publish something it has to you know uh, they have to understand or they're, they're required to do things like uh, add tags to their uh, to their posts you know what what is it you talked about here what are the essence of the words that you put in there so uh, you know some of these uh, you know these kinds of things don't have to be done with a uh, each student having their own domain we can do this as a uh, as a, uh, a community yeah and I think you know for yeah I think it's a variety of things so depending on the student depending on the you know income level of them or something like that not that it's expensive but I one thing that I think is powerful about the domain aspect is when I think back you know I've had a domain and a web space for probably somewhere in the order of eight or nine years at this point my actual website and the kind of stuff that I've done on it has changed dramatically from year to year sometimes. At this point I've sort of fallen on WordPress and sort of stayed with that, uh, but I've gone through various iterations. I think at one point I might have even been hand coding my site and it probably looked pretty awful too. Uh, but you know, I've gone through various iterations. The only thing that's remained constant is that domain. And I could even choose to map it to Tumblr, I could map it to Google Sites, I could point to a WordPress.com install, where WordPress.com, I'm not having to actually install something on a host, but that domain is mine, and that's that shortcut URL that's associated with my name, and as times change, as software change, that's the thing that comes with me. That's the thing that's not tied to this course that I'm taking with Karen Richardson, or, you know, this piece of software that I found next week that's really awesome and cool, you know, that's tied to me and I control it and I can then push it out to various spaces or make changes or do whatever I want with it, um, which I think is powerful. And when you think about the cost, you know, I think Namecheap.com is like seven bucks a year or something to get yourself a domain. So it's really not terribly expensive. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've been doing this a while, too. I started out hand-coding mine, and I used TypePad for a while, and then WordPress, and, you know, if, if something better comes along, I'll find some, you know, something else. But the key, I think, to this whole thing is you want something that makes it easy to just publish what you want. Yeah. You, you don't want to have to, you know, most people don't want to have to fool with a lot of the back end you know, I like getting into the plugins a little bit here and there, but that kind of—that's just me. But I mean, I think for a student who's more interested in whatever they're studying or whatever they're interested in, whether it's you know science or they like to write or something like that, you want to give them some tools that are just easy to to get things out there. And I, I well, one one of the things I've been doing is I've been working with uh, some teacher researcher projects. And this is an, a way for them to get their ideas out there quickly and easily and allow other people to comment on what they're doing. And I think that's, that's the key to this whole thing, is you want to be able to get your ideas out there and give other people some ways of, of responding. Mike, I'm going to call you out so because Tim, you are... actually have a WordPress multi oh, okay. install, and I'm curious how your students are using it. Uh, are there specific ways that the faculty in Fredericksburg are actually using that WordPress multi-site or, you know, are students doing student work directly on there? Are they publishing that out? You don't even know if you have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, wait a second. He's coming. <laughs> yeah, we're still learning the there technology. We go. <laughs> there we go. No, I, I had it muted and I couldn't find the uh, unmute there. 
Um, no, we have um, all our teachers have sites at Fredericksburg, and um, all of our students three through twelve have uh, a site, um, and those sites are broken up um, depending on the school. Um, and I say they all have a site. Um, they don't all use it, but they all have a site. Um, the majority of the students at the high school use it. Um, a portion of the students at the middle school use it. And there are a few sites up for the GT kids at uh, our three through uh, five school. And Josh, you mentioned portfolio work as being something interesting. And do you know, like, are there any ways right now that students are publishing their work, or is it really just contained into the classroom and something that they do, but then they might just keep on a flash drive? Um, we've been kind of uh, working with uh, our Moodle backend and tr trying different portfolios with Alfresco uh, that would kind of be multi-year things, and it's just been very difficult to get off the ground. Um, so, you know, if I have an AP art class where all of the kids need to have a portfolio, it'd be great if it was online. Um, maybe I have a 3D printer or make a maker club. You know, MIT is going to take maker portfolios. Sure. So, you know, I'm just kind of thinking how would I uh, create some opportunities and then how would they transition from high school to, to a college? Yeah, you know, to funny. what you're doing. It's funny, in, in higher education, there's a whole lot of talk of this idea of the e portfolio. Uh, so much so that you know when vendors jump on it and they're trying to sell you something that it's reached mainstream <laughs> to that point. And sure. uh, several years back, Mary Washington set up a committee to say, well, let's look into e-portfolios. And they spent years, I, th I think they spent three years, looking at all different objects. There's Mahara, which is an open source thing, which, um, you know, had its benefits. There, there are a lot now of LMSs, like Canvas, like Blackboard, that are building in e-portfolio style options into those systems as well. Uh, but, you know, they're so uncompelling. Like, I, I'll just be very frank and honest with you about it because it's sort of like, let's make these little container spaces where people can sort of set up something that might resemble a project that they might have done. Uh, but for students who are actually doing interesting work, like the open web for me is the e-portfolio. Like, that's the space to be in. I want someone to be able to Google my name and have me show up, not hopefully, you know, just have it be something that is tied back to a learning objective for a faculty member, and that's really the only benefit, and that's why the institution might go with it. So uh, for us, we just decided that, you know, rather than spend a ton of money at an e-portfolio system, let's rethink this all together. And at the time, we didn't know that Domain of One's Own was going to be it. We just kind of said, well, we've got UMW blogs, and there's some other options, so we'll sort of put that idea on the back burner and then this came along and it sort of just became the de facto answer for us is yeah this is how our students are going to be able to create that portfolio work. Everybody's quiet now. <laughs> well I was just going to jump in because Tim and I were you know lamenting Blackboard um, but I got called out sort of by one of my online students who is a teacher in Chesterfield mm. and um, they have Edmodo, but they use Blackboard for their honest to goodness online courses. And and she was saying, you know, it'd be nice if you could have that same like news feed sense of the on that you get with Facebook or Edmodo. And I just, you know, we've we've sort of put all our eggs in that Blackboard basket, and then you lose access to it. And I've tried to make a news feed in Blackboard, and it's impossible. And so I even think, are your professors at UMW doing more with their knowing that the students have this domain? I mean, I know yeah. it's early on. Well, you know, I mean, for us, what's really exciting is to experiment in these spaces. And it's something we've been doing for a while with this idea of um, really redistributing the idea of the course. So that, you know, and I mentioned this before, you know, with Domain of One's Own, every student has their own space. And we actually had courses that required that even before the project began. And so DS106 is a perfect example. Every student has their own blog that they set up on their own hosting environment. But then uh, we had this one mother blog where everything was sort of syndicating in. So all of the posts that each student was writing in their own space are then coming into a central space. And we've used that model successfully in several different disciplines. Uh, at this point, it's just become sort of rock, you know, not, it's not rocket science, right? it's just become sort of this recipe using a variety of WordPress plugins where, 
you know, a faculty member will install a plugin, they'll grab the URLs from all of their students and paste them in there, and then all of those posts start feeding in, but they all link back to their student spaces. So it's empowering for the student because they're blogging in their own space, and then that stuff's feeding into a central course site so the faculty member can look at one stream, one feed, you know, subscribe to it and get all that information. But then all of the commenting is happening on the student sites. It's something that we're continually working on is how can we make that better? And we've got a lot of different ideas of different ways that you can get at that to where, you know, we actually just uh, just uh, two days ago sort of flipped the idea on its head. Before we were thinking of, we, we had been using RSS for a long time now to sort of grab the URLs, feed those posts into a main site that you would use as the container. And now what we found just a few days ago and we started experimenting with is reversing that to where the student is actually pushing the post out using XML RPC, which is a protocol that WordPress has. It's what drives Word, WordPress's iPhone app and various other applications. It's basically an API that allows you to publish posts from a remote, from a remote place. And so there's plugins that you can use to automate this to where, as a student, if I have a space, I can say every time I use this specific category, just send that post on to this website as well. So it gets published well, in my space, but it also gets pushed off to another site entirely. And one of the other pieces that uh, we've looked at for our own in her internal uh, use is uh, the, the way that you can build community items or community features into uh, a WordPress site. Uh, there's a number of plugins for doing discussions. There's a number of uh, plugins for doing internal instant messaging, stuff like that. And that's the beauty of this kind of thing is that if you control the whole thing, you have all sorts of options for expanding it and for you know using these tools to do it, what you want with it. You you build basically what you need. Yeah, and I think you know that extensibility. That's that's the power there. It's also the you know, paralyzing fear for a faculty member, right? It's like, sure. as, on one hand, it's sort of like, oh my god, there's everything, I can do anything. And the other hand, it's like, oh my god, there's everything, and I guess I could do anything, or I don't really know what to do. So, you know, the it's also It's, it's, the also, it's also yeah. one of the fears of uh, the IT department, too. Yeah. One of the reasons why we have Blackboard is because they like having control over everything. And we're we're like almost I think we're two versions behind in Blackboard because they have to do all this extensive testing and everything before they roll out anything um, with our internal WordPress uh, installations we try it out on a test install if it seems to work okay we give it to everybody and see what happens well it's that lovely idea of standardization you know if everybody's on the same platform if everybody's doing the exact same thing It'll make everybody's lives so much easier, but it won't be powerful, it won't be interesting, and it might not even be meaningful, but it'll be standard. <laughs> and it all so. depends on what you're interested in. I mean, if you're not interested in having a discussion uh, forum on your, on your site, don't put it on there. I mean, that's just sure. the nature of things. So anyway, um, for, uh, I have a question, though, about your uh, domain of your own. Mm -hmm. Students, they, they, you're buying the domain name for them, and they're taking that with them, right? When they when they leave the college. Yep, um, we have migration strategies for them to so, transfer their domain out. So they then have to go find a hosting service to to use it with after they graduate. You're yeah, not giving, I mean, you, you're not giving them perpetual hosting services. If only we were one of those research ones that has such a large endowment that they can just feed off the interest for years to come sure. and run a program. But <laughs> unfortunately, no, with a small liberal arts college, uh, we, we haven't yet figured out the, the not to make it happen to where we can let them continually have it. Uh, the really nice thing about it, we do have migration strategies for students. So they can get their authorization code and they can transfer that domain out to Hover, to Namecheap, to any other number of service and take that with them. Uh, they can archive and get a backup of their files very easily themselves. It doesn't even require us. They can get a backup at any time. Um, we use industry standard uh, hosting tools. We run on cPanel, the same software that Bluehost runs on, which actually makes it dead simple to move to a different environment because sure. it's, you know, while it's not open source, cPanel is becoming like one of the de facto hosting panels. And sure. you can rock and find a hundred different hosting services 
that will bring that stuff in. And it, even if it, if it wasn't cPanel, you know, it's HTML, CSS, it's all the same stuff that all the different ones are running. Uh, what's interesting to me is that now we're starting to see hosting services, uh, you know, the price just continues to drop and the services uh, are getting more interesting. So uh, Bluehost actually created a whole separate entity called Spoke, uh, which is geared directly towards education and it allows students to have a hosting space for I think something like four dollars a month. Uh, so, you know, that's interesting to me is that they're trying to hit it that, you know, I mentioned uh, my boss Jim Groom and I, you know, we're starting our own little I don't want to call it a venture or something. We're just sort of <laughs> trying to take this idea of domain of one's own and sort of make it available to everyone as well. And so, um, you know, we're going to be doing some stuff like that too. Uh, and I think you're going to see more hosting providers start to think about that. But the nice thing is that there's a lot of choice there. If we as Mary Washington had gone with Mahara uh, or if we had gone with any of these vendor-driven e-portfolio solutions, there would be no choice. For the student, it would be, Either I back up my stuff and that's what it is, or I continue to pay this one company seventy dollars a year to keep my portfolio up after I graduate. I wonder, um, um, do you guys have any sort of uh, feeling for what is the cost per student for what you're doing? I mean, I, I can't imagine it's that expensive, and you know, for for some others, you know, for even a public school trying to do this. I mean, are we talking about maybe? Couple dollars a month, uh, even less. You're talking roughly around fifteen dollars a year per student. Okay, so, so that's yeah, not bad. It's about, uh, it's about ten dollars, ten dollars a domain for the students. Right. And however, X amount per student on your server. So that that's really a numbers game. So you've got a server; it costs X amount per year divided by the number of students. Usually, only a couple dollars a student. So it's it's uh, interesting. The uh, the hosting service that I use has a special today for uh, Talk Like a Pirate Day. They're taking 44.44% off of their, uh, their oh, yeah. hosting ser uh, fees today. So, yeah. If you want that, I'll give that to you later. <laughs> yeah, we, so when we were running our numbers, we actually realized just how cheap this could be for a university like ours, which is somewhere around 4,500 students. We realized at full capacity, if every single one got a domain, and we were running this every single year, it would cost us, at total, about 50000 a year to run the entire project. That's, you know, 4,500 domains and a server, and that's sure. all it was. You know, we added a little bit more in there for development and stuff like that. You can get, you know, a lot cheaper if it's a K-12 environment where you might, you know, have, you know, 400, 500 students, you know, depending, you know, on a school system and, and what you're doing. And in some cases, your IT department might already have the server. Now, of course, like you mentioned, it's going to be the fight with the IT department possibly about what you are and aren't allowed to do. Uh, but these tools aren't terribly difficult to use. They're not terribly difficult to set up. Sure. And it really is empowering. So yeah, um, we, have, we have regular arguments over uh, open source where we are. So, so mm -hmm. that's a different story. But yeah, I, I can see, you know, this, this is the kind of thing that is... is where the value way, uh, far outweighs what you're paying for it. So, I mean, and I think, the idea. And I think it starts with the faculty. It starts with the individual courses, you know, with people, you know, sort of breaking away from the mold and saying, with my class, I'm going to do this, and we're going to try this out. And, you know, we saw that with WordPress. We saw that with other technologies where it was like, we're going to go over here and do this thing as opposed to what everyone else is doing and see if it works or not. And if it does, you tell your, your, your colleagues about it, and they try it too. And then suddenly you've got an entire department saying, we're all doing this. You know, and why can't the IT department just support us? And what if we built it in as an institutional thing? I think that's... That for me is, you know, really an important point about what we did at Mary Washington was that we didn't just wake up one morning and decide to give every student a domain. Like, you know, it wasn't like, hey, everybody's getting an iPad. You know, like, you know, it's just something you're just suddenly going to get. We built a culture over the course of seven years or more of, you know, constant experimentation and the idea that everything's a pilot and we're just trying these things out. You know, we had faculty doing the whole idea of doing this stuff out in the open for several years. And so we kept continuing to build on top of that, get more faculty involved, get departments to think about it. And to where, you know, at some point we reached a critical mass to be able to say, you know, 
this is something that we could roll out institutionally and that it would actually make sense. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, we've got about 15, 15 minutes. I mean, we don't have any set schedule, but I do want to make sure that we have a chance for you to talk about the hacker space that's going to be at Vistie because I think that ties in so beautifully with what we're talking about, this idea of experimentation. And so I don't want us to, to end this discussion without mentioning it. So, Well, yeah, the, the, the whole idea behind this is, is exactly what we're talking about here is what can you do to empower yourself and empower your students to, to try new things, to experiment, to uh, extend what you already have. Um, we're, we're talking with people about uh, uh, the whole maker uh, approach to things. I don't know if, how many are familiar with that, but the idea that students you know, can bring physical objects into the class and make things with them or extend them or modify them. Uh, the whole uh, Arduino, uh, Raspberry Pi sort of approach. I've seen some really amazing things going on with those little boards, and we're hoping to get some people with examples for that. Um, this whole idea of hacking the web that we're talking about, where you take control of your own space and, and make it uh, whatever it is you want to do. And uh, that's that's pretty much the approach. Uh, we're, we're interested, anybody that wants to come in and and uh, spend a little time talking about what they're doing and show off what they're doing, uh, we'd love to have you. And, and Josh, I imagine you'll be spending quite a bit of time down there as well. <laughs> well, I have some, some project ideas. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. I mean, more than anything else, I'd, I'd like to get some, exa some uh, opportunities for people to come down and maybe do a little hands-on. We have uh, uh, one vendor that's got a robotics kit that we're going to uh, have a couple of them down there for people to try out and play with. Uh, we've got some, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the, uh, the Mozilla Foundation and, and their uh, uh, WebMaker program or system. Basically, it allows you to take uh, resources on the web and repackage them into projects that... Uh, you, the students can show off, and, and so we're going to have some some uh, things from them. Uh, at this point, we're just you know trying to figure out how much we can squeeze into this uh, small space and small amount of time because uh, there's too many ideas for for the two and a half three days that we have. So and we have to stay out of the way of. Uh, some of the bigger stuff, because Karen gets mad if I get in the way of the, the keynote speakers or things like that. <laughs> People start ditching the keynote for your space. Yeah. Oh, we're also going to do a... Um, yeah, sorry. We're also going to do a photo walk uh, Sunday evening. This is something okay. we did at, at uh, ISTE, which was a lot of fun. We don't quite have the Alamo to walk around and you know that kind of stuff, but... I figure that uh, there's there'll be some Christmas lights up around uh, the hotel and out, out in the uh, in the city with uh, some uh, some nice night lights and everything like that, and we'll have some fun uh, taking pictures and seeing what we get, and then uh, coming back and taking a look at what we can do with those pictures. Yeah, that's awesome. And you know, you mentioned Mozilla. Mozilla's doing a lot of really interesting stuff with this idea of making for the web. You know, they've yeah. always been a company I think that is focused on the open web and open tools, HTML, JavaScript, and that kind of stuff. But more recently, they've really come out with a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, the the what's it called? The popcorn, popcorn maker. Yeah. Popcorn. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, it's a it's basically a site where you can take resources that are already on the web whether it's a video or an animation or something like that, and add your own uh, features to it. And you're not stealing anybody else's thing because it's still linked to wherever it is, but you, you put it into a new form. And it's, uh, there's some interesting projects that some kids have done with this, and we've got some examples of that we're going to be showing off. Yeah, I love that idea of treating the web almost like a canvas for you to remix and play around with. And I'm sure we could probably spend another hour talking about, or more talking about making and hacking and 3D printing and Arduino and all that other stuff, but uh, we'll, we'll probably end it there. Karen, I don't know if you had any other like late announcements or anything else that you wanted to mention before we closed up. Uh, I do not. Uh, 
conferences coming up and the hackerspace is certainly an area and since there's a few of us in here but you know anything you want me to advertise Tim Stommer I'm happy to do and um, here's the link to the Mozilla stuff we did a little bit with bit with that this summer right um, when we were up in Loudoun County yeah, so. and the hummingbird was um, the one I was trying to think of so yeah the right. hummingbird robot kits I haven't seen yes. them yet so um, I'm anxious I to give them a try too yeah, right. Just to see what happens. So, no, this has been fabulous, and and I kind of like just sitting here and chatting um, with folks. So hopefully it was useful to at least the five of us. And thank you very much, Tim. I I love just the approach at Mary Washington, having been involved with several other institutions of higher education. The let's just experiment and see how it goes is often not one of the driving <laughs> philosophies behind what they do. I, at one of my institutions, it took them three years to introduce Gmail to the faculty and I know why because it had taken them so long to train them on using Outlook that they just really didn't have the time and energy to retrain them to use another email so I, I love that whole philosophy of of just experimenting and see what happens and and I think that building capacity piece too even for K-12 we want it to happen and we want it to happen now and I think Mike George said it too you have the ability to use it. Not everybody in Fredericksburg is, but it's out there if you want to, and you just sort of help people along. So anyway, well, thank you very much, everyone. This was great, and I think we'll try this again for our hackerspace piece as well. Um, so have a lovely evening, gentlemen. Excellent. Y'all take care.